Hi, everyone. I guess I'm that guy. <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk about transparency in a startup. Um, 30 second background of mine, I'm, I'm one of the early guys in hosting. Uh, back, back before it was called hosting, I started a hosting company. It was called Virtual Serving in the 90s. Then I, for some reason, got into telecom and started a tel telecom company. Had a couple of, I've had an exit. I've still got Finality uh, is the last company I started in Culver City. It's got about 200 people there. I'm no longer there. So I've been in tech for 15 years or so, largely on the infrastructure side. And my failures I've had on the social side. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Um, so when, uh, when Paul asked me to talk last second notice, um, I, I wanted to talk about something I've never talked about before. So to be fully transparent, this is a first run at this. It's something that I don't think really gets talked about a lot in startups. And by the time people really talk about it, it's too late. And so I call it transparency in the startup. What's funny about this image is when I Googled the word transparency, this is the first image that came up. <laughs> so, it was, for me, it told me a lot about like what the interwebs considers transparency, which is a see-through shirt. So, it's actually tailored search for you only. <laughs> oh, it's, it's adjusted for me. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the funny thing is, I didn't find this. So, what I'm gonna—I I struggled in making the slideshow because I was trying not to make a touchy-feely show. I was trying to—I was trying to create tangible business benefits and figuring out how to draw a line between a transparent culture, a transparent company, and success. And as I worked to do that, I couldn't. I couldn't prove that goodness equaled money. I, I, maybe a study outside my pay scale could do it. So I kind of abandoned that, and I kind of backed up from why, why it was important to me. So I, didn't, I never wanted to be a businessman, because my family had told me they were liars and cheats and thieves and all these things, demagoguing. I was a technology guy. So when I came into business, I was very conscious of the issues that I had heard about and seen while I, while I worked jobs. And um, I guess I wanted to start by asking a question of, has anyone here ever had a bad work environment? Raise your hand. Uh, wow. So like 60, 70 percent, that's, that's actually a loss. So throw out some reasons about why you've had a bad work environment. Does okay. anyone? Bad culture? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Uh, oh, uh, just people that weren't there because they believed in what you were doing. Just because they were there to get a check. Like morale almost? Yeah. Yeah. Cool, what else? Stupid boss. Stupid yeah. boss. Yeah. And what do you mean by stupid? Yeah. Just crazy ideas, crazy, crazy uh, plans, crazy like execution of push, pushing all this. Um, they were asking customers what they want, something like that. And when you told, and when you told him he was crazy, he didn't listen. <laughs> or you wouldn't dare tell him. You wouldn't dare tell him, right? <laughs> we never tell us. Got it. He's crazy. Okay. What else? I'd say the flow of information from like me through management and vice up and down. Yeah. Where well, you feel you feel cut off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so therefore management feels stupid. I've noticed that. Though. To me, sometimes when I don't know why they're making decisions, I, I you know they, people tend to think that management doesn't know what's going on. Right. Yep. Same thing. It's just people withhold information for power. Oh, interesting. Okay. An organization designed to not allow information to flow up from the employees, it only flows down from the, the top. Right. One-way communication. Interesting. So I'm hearing a theme of communication. Anything else? No. Okay, that's roughly close to the list that I built. Is your Twitter handle Chris underscore Lyman? I honestly don't even know. I think so. I haven't used it in so long. So, have any, I, raise your hand if you had a bad customer experience. I'm sure everybody has. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, yeah I mean, we've, all, we've all had that. Let's hear, I don't know, five reasons why you've had a bad customer experience. I'll in start. In inability for um, the person that you're speaking to to make a decision based on what you Like, like not like they're not empowered, okay? Like a support person or whatever. Cool. Unreasonable Anything else? Unreasonable expectations. Unreasonable expectations. Okay. Scripted answers versus customized to your needs. Nice. Good one. Anything else? 
All right, cool. So this is what that's kind of what I was hoping everyone was going to say, because I couldn't get tangible, absolutely direct revenue numbers. But when I sat down and thought about all the bad experiences I had, had either inside or outside, they all roughly map to an, a non-transparent culture. Information flow is about transparency. Scripted answers is about transparency. Um, One-way communication is about transparency. A stupid boss who won't listen to a damn thing because his way is right, i.e. he's not being transparent. So I was able to build mappings that made a lot of sense to me inside and outside. So problem's universal. 31%, one in three people say they've been actively pressured at work to be dishonest. I know this is small, sorry. 31% actively pressured at work to be dishonest. 65% of folks believe, this is a Rasmussen poll, 65% believe there should be an incentive beyond virtue to be honest. I thought it was interesting. Like they want to get paid to play. And 52% of Americans believe that most workers are dishonest in order to get ahead of the workplace. So whether that's true or not, that's the common perception. So it's universal. There's a study done here at UCLA. Does anyone know the study by Dan Ehrlich? It's really interesting. So he did this study. He got a bunch of people together and gave them a 10 question, a bunch of students gave them a 10 question math test. And you had five minutes to do it. And when the math test was over, you had to, he would read the right answers. You would put a check next to the right ones, go to the back of the room, run it through a paper shredder, come to the front of the room, and on the honor system, say how many questions you got right. You get a dollar per correctly answered question. So what he found is that people got four answers right, but reported six. So he found widespread minor cheating when he ran this test. Uh, no. Turns out we do. Shocker. I don't think so. <laughs> I can't believe it. Look at Utah, 100%. So they put out these free kiosks. You can read this. Uh, Honest Tea put out a bunch of tea on our system for a dollar, put a dollar in, and they measured the honesty rates by city. So pretty impressive though, overall that people paid 93%. Overall, there was a lot of human goodness in there. I was impressed. All right, so I think we're all pretty clear that lack of transparency screws up the company. I don't think I need to prove that. And, and it manifests itself in all kinds of ways. And starting at the top, by the time it gets to the support person on the phone, you feel like you're getting a script or a runaround or lack of empowerment. So all the customer affecting ways are where we really feel it on the outside. And so the, the, what I've been trying to tackle my whole career is how to not do this. Because nobody wants this kind of a company. And particularly when it's two guys in a garage or a guy and a gal and an idea or a 10 person company, you might not even have any of this. And then you wake up one day and you got a 50, 100 person company and, it's, and it starts getting weird. I'm telling you, I've gone over 100 twice now and it gets weird. It, it, it sneaks right up on you and you're like, how did this place get so freaking strange? And it got so strange because when it was one, two, and three of you, you didn't make really clear decisions about who you wanted to be. In your head you had it, you wanted to be a good person. We all want to be good people. But the difference between wanting to, to be good and run a good company and actually setting the tone is actually quite hard. It's something I've really had to think through. And so what I want to talk about today is not the answer. It's just some distinct systems that I've tried that I have found particularly effective in my companies and still been successful. So with that being said, I want to like caveat this thing. So here's some transparency math. This is completely fake. This isn't real science. But I was trying to understand. So you know when you, think you, you figure out you've been fooled? You're furious. You're much madder than if you just found out about the hurt. You know, you, you, you leave your spouse be, not because they cheated on you, but because they lied about it, right? So you get this like really high pain point when people withhold. So in the, in the beginning of being non-transparent, everything's easy. There's a short-term gain. And then when it breaks because it's been withheld, you get like a really high pain point. And then, it, and then there's a decay rate that I said roughly was half of the decay rate. And then I looked at the front-loaded pain. <laughs> Boom, you deal with it. I said, I just guessed here, I said it's roughly half as bad, 100 versus 200. You deal with it, it decays faster because people trust you because you came out with it, you have a transparent culture, and then you're back to normal. So the math that I figured out roughly is that when viewed, transparency viewed through any lens other than short term is a successful policy. So that's Mark Twain, if you tell the truth you don't have to remember anything, I think everyone knows that one. All right, so where the hell do you start? All right. <laughs> start with in my case, I had to start with me. I had to start with me in a big way. 
um, I had to start by declaring it to myself that I really wanted this. And I had to communicate that very clearly to the rest of my founding team that I wanted that to be really important, what that meant. And I decided that first and foremost that meant that anything could be said to anybody, me, at any time insofar as it, as it was polite, and really, 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 really walk that walk. And so I, I created a really incredible open door policy. I actually changed the name of my business card to CEO and janitor. And, and, and that was just to remind myself that, yeah, I was a CEO, but I also cleaned toilets. And I was just keeping myself in line. So I found that I had to, and by the way, that got harder as the company got bigger. As VCs funded us, and there was perks available, and I had I could start to act and you know walk differently than everyone else. I found it became harder and harder to keep myself in check. It was really easy when it was three of us at a table, but 150 of us in the company, and my internet gets slow, and IT shows up and gives me my own special T3 just for me, and all of a sudden I've got the best internet, and the rest of the employees don't, and I never even noticed. They just gave me internet. So policing myself and to make sure that I was walking the walk was really, really, really important part of it. I wrote a blog about this if you want to check it out. It's called Roses Where I Walk. Everywhere you look, there's rose petals, and you mm. think the world is rose petals. And it's not. You're just getting the rose petals. So once once I established that, I um I had to start figuring out how to get that relationship with my founders. How, What's the average size of companies in here? Just so I know what I'm talking to. Is, that, is this two man companies, five man companies, one, one woman man companies? One man. One, four, four, two. Okay. So raise your hand if your company is larger than five. Okay. All right. So this is founders. Cool. Awesome. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll stick to that. So as a rule, I made a deal with my founders that we could say anything to each other at any time. Not all of them accepted it. I eventually had to let go of one of the founders because, because of the ego. But that was the general rule, was there was just nothing sacred. We are not sacred. And, 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 and the word we used for it was data responsive. We are going to be a data responsive company. Meaning no matter how firm we were in the opinion, if the data suggests otherwise, we immediately go the other direction. And so we would do a lot of hard zigzagging, trying to get it right, and the difference between the, the speed by which we could zigzag was the ego by which we were attached to our vision of the idea. So data responsiveness was really, really important to me. So this is an interesting graph. The culture comes your values, comes your attitude, comes the behavior. And that's the thing I was talking about. As you said it, this is the support person you feel on the phone. This is who your company is in a few years. And it starts up there. So it was an interesting process trying to get this message integrated into the company, even once the founders, trying to get it into the, set, into the staff. And I found myself repeating myself a lot. No, that's not how we do business. No, that's not how we do business. That's not how we do business. And I got very frustrated by, the, by having to repeat myself all the time until one day I remembered that why is it that parents constantly repeat things to their kids? Yet we only say things once to each other in a company, and I already told you that. So then I wrote a blog called, if I'm not being a parrot, I'm not doing my job. If I'm not being a parrot, I'm not doing my job. In order to remember that, I had to repeat this mantra. By the time my second company came around, I got really sick of it. So I decided to get efficient with this. So it was a, we were an open source telecommunications company. And so I made the motto of the company, communicate openly. It was smart enough so that the rest of the world would see it as a telecom, message, but it was valued enough that we could simply say to each other in a challenging situation, you know, I get this all the time, not one. My sales VP would walk in, hey Chris, I got this, I got this really hard situation. I've got a $50,000 sale. If we make it, we're going to make our money. But here's the issue. They want this feature that we don't have, but I think if I tell them we have it, and we'll have it the next version, then I can still close the sale. What do you think? Every time, communicate openly. So I would just say, communicate openly, communicate openly. 
And what I noticed happened after about six to eight months, I would start to hear that phrase kind of being mentioned throughout the company. And it just became a core value. In fact, Google did, the, did this with don't be evil. You guys know that that's Google's informal motto? Who knew that? Yeah. So you guys know what Facebook's informal motto is? Move fast, break things. Interesting. Who here has a generally positive feeling about Google when you use Google products? Okay, who here has a generally positive feeling about Facebook? Uh, it's about 50% difference, and, I, and I'd say that's about right. It's really interesting. And Google's really big, and usually you, the bigger they are, the more you hate them. They've managed to keep that feeling of goodness, and I think it starts the don't be evil. So, did funny. Did the sales guy get that deal when you went back and told the customer to shoot? I don't actually know. I don't remember. But I found more often than not you do. I found like the, there's when 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 you feel like you're being leveled to, I just you just do better in general. I don't remember. So funding was an interesting challenge for me. That's a very weird process. I call it professionally begging for millions of dollars. And how do you both be in a subordinate role of asking for money while also talking to, you know, dealing straight. And I, I've raised money seven times. I've raised as little as half a million, and I've raised as much as 12 million in a round. And I'm seven for seven between three companies. So I've, I've done it all, I've raised, every, I've raised money everywhere. And I try, what I decided about raising money is that investors were people, they're just normal people. Okay, I've got this, I've got this thing. Even though they're cold and they like to eat babies, <laughs> underneath there they've got to be people. This was my favorite. They've got to be able to feel in their belly when someone is talking straight to them. And they've got to be able to feel when someone's fast talking. Because when I'm fast talking, I can feel it in my belly. They've got to be really good at, at it. This is what they do. So I decided to just be very comfortable saying the phrase no one says in corporations, I don't know. And they would ask me a question that I should know and I didn't, I'd say, I don't know, I'll figure it out. When they would ask me, tell me what keeps you up at night, I would tell them you know, the real things, the, 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 the scary things, the things that might make me a bad investment opportunity. And I, I just leveled with them as much as I could, and I, I can't prove that this is why, but I have been very successful. So I can empirically tell you that leveling with investors completely does not diminish and may increase your chances of funding. That I'm sure. So once you get investors, they sit on your board. And that's a really weird experience too. Because you suddenly suddenly you have bosses, which is we kind of do this to not have bosses, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got bosses, and you only see them once a month, and so they're like the absentee boss. And so that was a really weird experience for me sitting at the board. And what I decided about that was the same thing. I decided, you know, my first few board meetings, I, I think I did the dog and pony shiny show. And then eventually I realized, you know what? I gotta tell these I gotta tell these people everything. And more they became, in some cases, actually friends. You know, people that I hang out with to this day. So I, I found this continuing message to go all the way through it. I wanna I, I wanna uh, give you one last stat, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna show you something interesting. Remember that study I said at UCLA where most of the room cheated? So they ran that study again. And this time they ran it with 450 students and they did split testing into an AB group. Into the 225A group, before they took this math test, they asked them to, on a piece of paper, write down, I think, the last 10 books they had read, or the last 10, or the 10 favorite books. And then they had them take the math test and, and check their honesty. The other group, they had write down all the 10 commandments they could remember. And then they had them take the test. Really interesting. Guess what the error rate was for the folks that wrote down, guess what the cheat rate was for the folks that wrote down their last 10 books compared to the original? Yeah. Exactly the same. Guess what the cheat rate was for the 10 commandments? Zero. 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 They had a zero cheat rate. So they, they ran another experiment with it against that control. They then tried it, having them write down not the 10 commandments, but UCLA's honor code, whatever UCLA's motto is, zero percent. Isn't that interesting? 
So, so the lesson, and I just found this out yesterday, that, that wasn't, communicate openly was what I was trying to accomplish, but that's data that proves. Just a gentle reminder, people actually want to do the right thing. Support people want to be empowered. Salespeople don't want to lie to close sales. If that's happening, it's their boss. And if it's their boss, it's their boss's boss. And if it's their boss's boss, it's you guys. You can feel the culture of a company when you walk in to a Starbucks. You can tell what's happening upstairs. You, can, you walk into In-N-Out versus Burger King. It's a real, it's a real big difference. And if you look into it, then well, people are happy, they're bustling, and they can feel good, and there's reasons why behind that. So I call that you know, trickle-down truthonomics. Just my funny political term for that. All right. So now I'm going to get extreme here. So this is an experiment I ran at my last startup. I, I wanted to see at which point transparency could be too much. And the area I decided to tackle was a challenging one that I think a lot of you guys are going to be running into, which is how do you figure out how much equity to give the first few folks that join the company? after the founding team, or even with the founding team. How do you figure out how to give them in month four, when they join in five, when they join in six, when they made this salary? It's a, it's a really weird process, and it's a very secretive process. You know, especially as the company gets a little bigger, it's done in, you know, you go, you, you close the deal, you come out, you shake their hand, and nobody talks about it. And I really didn't like the process. So I, I decided to see if we could do an open pay, open equity model at my last company. And so I built this spreadsheet. I've actually used it. Does anyone have any water? Yeah, can we use some? That'd be awesome. Yeah, I got it. Can you get it? Thanks, man. So what this is, is this is a spreadsheet. By the way, this is not tax safe. I've been informed that there are potential tax consequences of this. So this is a theoretical model if you want to use it. And, and if you do want to use it, I'll email this to you. I've actually used it now at three companies. But it's gotten, it's gotten better each time. What I wanted to figure out is, you got a person joining the company. They may or may not bring some cash. They used to make some money before they're going to come work for you for much less. Here's the amount of money that they want to make. And that becomes their deferred cash. So, so basically, you take the cash that they're bringing to the table, if any. You take the difference between what they should make in the market versus what they're willing to make now. And you take the month that they joined with a decay rate by month, decaying the risk, decaying the value of their equity, the amount of the equity granted by whatever you want. I said 10% per month. If you join in month six, it's a fundamentally different risk equation than if you join in month one. But you can set the decay rate. And what pops out is exactly how many shares of equity they have. Is that pre having raised any money to, though? Yeah, I use this pre. It gets really weird. It would be really yeah. complex if you had raised some cash. Too. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's, well, not necessarily because you would make the hundred percent the option pool. Well, your ten percent decay rate would have to go up because if you have money in the bank, you're less risky, right? Or no? Well, I mean, your decay rate is an opinion. I just get so. But I guess I would say this is the, this is yes, this is more towards founders. If I were to use this, that's interesting. I've never used this at scale. Because a lot of these guys are at, like, I've raised one hundred and fifty to three hundred, yep. and now I got to go get employee number three. Mm -hmm. So in that scenario, I'm a little less risky because I got money in the bank for at least six to 12 months. Sure. But so this would need a few modifications in order to work with funding. It would just be the decay rate. Just, just no, for example, I calculate total uh, value of the company as a function of what the cash that's been put yeah. in and the deferred salary equals cash. So you'd have to, you'd have to add that to it. So you'd add the equity, the cash gone yeah. in. And yeah. You'd have to add that to it. I got to think through that and there's some other issues. But, um, but, but, but the point about the transparency thing is I had used this in two other startups before. And in the last startup I did, I decided to make this an open document. So everybody could see everybody's equity and everybody's salary. And I decided to see how that would, how, that, how people would deal with that. And I, can, I only got to seven or eight in that company, but the process went from days sometimes weeks of negotiation to an hour, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the, the hour was them dealing with, I just, I would send them the spreadsheet and I would say, put your figures in. You can have as much equity as you want, put your figures in, send it back to me. 
and there it goes. And they would spend an hour or overnight thinking about it, tweaking the numbers, and they would say, and I would make sure everyone else was in there. And so it worked, at least up until six or seven in that company, it worked really well. And, and, I, and I also found that it made, it kept me really honest, because I couldn't do funky deals with people to get them. So this is extreme. The, the, the open part of it is extreme. This is, a, this is just a really good working model. If any of you guys want it, you can email me for it. So, okay. questions, ideas, thoughts? Yeah. I have a question about this. Um, can you sympathize with those people who say that distributing a spreadsheet like this, perhaps not in the early stages, but all of a sudden <laughs> in a company, perhaps by mistake, is like dropping a nuclear bomb on your own company? Would I agree that distributing compensation in a, in a developed company is like a nuclear bomb? Is that your question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that I believe that, but there, there are people who believe that, and I'm wondering if you can sympathize with that. Why I would say the effect, the blast radius would be commensurate to the inequity in the compensation packages and the amount of secrecy around them. And in some companies, that's major, and, and, and there would be fallout from it. And that's why people keep it secret. I get what you know. I get why people are so. There, there are always good reasons for lack of transparency. They don't randomly happen. There are always good reasons. But I believe, as a function of just my own testing and examination, that examined from medium to long term, those reasons start to fall apart. So yeah, if you kept a lot of secrets and then it gets out one day, it's like getting caught cheating. Sure. Yeah. Uh, does this have a potential for opening you up to any legal? This? Yeah, particularly if people look at that and they say, well, I do the same job as so-and-so, but he's getting paid more than me, and therefore I'm going to go to court because I'm female, or I'm black, or I'm Hispanic, and they're white, and gotcha. Well, I only have used this in the founding stages of the company. Okay. Uh, by the time I've got an HR department, there's this isn't happening anymore. Yeah. Okay. This was those, because, because by that time you're getting stock options and the packages get relatively standard. You can go look up and see what a VP of engineering gets for a company that's in its eighth month and you know, first round of funding. It's the really wonky first X10 number of folks who you're negotiating with, <laughs> and a lot of times there's bitterness that results from this. They feel like you didn't give them enough, and, and it kept me very honest. Actually, I was pissed by the number that came out for me. I thought I was worth much more than that. Mm. Having, it leveled the playing field, by the way, also. I had, 10 times the business experience of some of the other folks. And it leveled the playing field and made me dramatically increase my cash into the company. So it kept me honest. So you ask if there's legal issues, I don't know. I do know that, that I've, been, I've been advised informally that there's tax, there may be tax consequences of this. Because I've been advised that once you start using words like deferred salary, then the equity effectively just got priced. So it's no longer worth one penny. So this should be circulated with uh, this is for jokes only kind of email. Okay. In doing this, um, you said you've done it a couple times. It, it, I mean, I, I don't know if you were able to gauge this or not, but almost like the people that are coming in after you to see almost like how much skin you put into it and so that they, it almost seems like it would ramp or um, get everybody to want to invest more or to see like, hey, this is what Chris is doing. So say you start a company, I come in, I'm like, man, this guy's really invested. Let me like, work hard for almost. Like a that's, really hard to, that's hard to measure, but I can speak for how smooth all the hires were. Right. My first two early engineers, they were best friends in the company. One came first, got his equity. The second guy came a month later, gave him his spreadsheet, he plugged it in. He came out 1% less than his friend. They never had an issue with it. I didn't even have to, I never had a single, uh, I, never had, I never had a single counter offer in the first seven hires. Hmm. I great. do remember that. Well, there's nothing to count there, otherwise the, the percentage just change and doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I, you know, I had people counter their, their offers. I had people that took a salary, the next day said, ah, I'm willing to take another $20,000 pay cut to get more equity. Willingness to invest cash or expected salary 
from wrestling students, but, but perhaps something else that people are contributing to the company right there in the founding process. That's the challenge with this, right? You right. mean like how awesome you are and how really badass your network really is awesome. and how good looking you are? <laughs> yeah. Skills, yeah. I know. How do you do that? Right. Well, your opinion of yourself is going to be much higher than my opinion of you. Yes. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the pro I, I, I fundamentally had that issue with this model, which is I legitimately had more experience. But you know what? That more experience meant that I had more money. And so I put more money in to get back up to the equity. So if you're really good in business, that means you probably have had some successes. So it kind of, it kind of kept me on. What I'm saying is it kept me honest. And that's the whole point of this entire talk is it's all about us and our values. That seems a nice one. I'm just kidding. Besides this one for doing this thing? Yeah, for, for like early... Uh, I, I haven't, no. I haven't even researched it. I just... Um, I, I stole a very rudimentary version of this from a, a successful buddy of mine about 10, 10 years ago, and I've been tweaking it, you know, ever since then. It does work a little bit better for you because you put in so much cash. It would be very hard to use this if you were starting with nothing. Nobody put in anything and you just put in sweat equity. No, it works fine. I mean, what do you mean? So, so I guess it, I guess that's you, true. I guess you, you just take out the cash invested line, and the total, so the total value the total down. value goes down. I guess and, that's true. I mean, that's and, and if you're really a, and if you're really this badass that has no money, you definitely were getting you should be getting at least a good salary. Right. Somebody had to have thought you were good, and so again the, the model adjusts for it. Total value of the company is less. But yeah. Yeah. yeah I, if anyone, if anyone can improve this, please do because it, it, has, it has been a working model for me. So you guys like this? this is the piece you guys like? <laughs> okay. Pretty cool. good. Yeah, it was open and everyone could look at it, and I was able to sleep at night feeling like I hadn't, you know, because I've had to make weird deals with folks before. I've had to really dramatically overpay in some cases, and then underpay in other cases when I could get away with it. And, and I don't know, I just didn't like the feeling, so I tried this one. Yeah, I think that's it. Any questions, anything else? Yeah? Can you explain it? Oh, so, so what I was trying to do was um, risk adjust for time. So let me get to it. So the longer you wait to join a startup, the lower the risk is, i.e. it hasn't gone bankrupt. And the person that joins on month one or month zero has a very different risk profile than the person who joins on month 12. And so I put a decay rate in there. I really honestly arbitrarily picked 10%, no one argued. It seemed to me that you join three months later, it's 30% less risky. Oh, you just, you take the, you take the equity they would have gotten, and then the month that, you put the month that they join here, and then it decays in another spread, it just decays by 10% every month. So if it's three months, it would be a compounded 30%. In this particular model, apparently, if you join in month 11, you don't get any equity. So this, you know, you might want to adjust that to K rate to five. But honestly, after about six months, I I'm no longer really doing right, big an equity option, grants. You got an option for that one. Yeah, and then you don't have this luxury, and then it gets all formal. But, but uh, you you still could probably use this model now that I'm thinking of it. You could make this yeah the option pool model. You could. Yeah. You couldn't. You couldn't do. You could say that total option pool is 15%, and based on that, you you, you just you got to get careful. You got to be careful with the deferred salary part at a certain point in the company size. So this is a really early stage thing, and, and frankly, I think right for this group. Yes. I think you touched on when you talked about repeating yourself. I wonder if you're talking a little bit more about like tools or things you can do to break people out of bad, non-transparent habits. Because I feel like a lot of this stuff is just habits. Like we're oh, we're going to talk about this stuff. That is, that's really, that's a good question. So <clears throat> what I noticed 
was people are scared to come forward in companies. They're scared to say their boss is stupid. They're scared to say a process is broken, but, but they know. And I had to work unreasonably hard to provide safety for and comfort for people who did tell me things. And the way that I did that is first I would, I would say it and teach it, and then I would start to promote based on it. So it was very obvious in my company that if you kind of sh shot straight, you advanced very fast. And you know, I had a 19-year-old engineer running my entire engineering department at one point because he was such a straight shooter. So um, let me see, how did I improve? How did I, uh, I would, the power of I don't know was a really big one. I wrote this blog called The Power of I Don't Know, playing on the power of now. It's unbelievable how hard it is for people to say I don't know. And I would actively, I would thank people in meetings for saying I don't know. Because they waste 10 minutes fast talking, instead of saying I don't know, great, get back to me next week next. So in just creating a real culture of safety and reward around integrity. And it's amazing how it just, you know, it picks up very quickly. It picks up very quickly. And first and foremost, they're going to watch you. And the kind of things that you do, leading by example. Is there cronyism? Is there nepotism? That kind of stuff is really unraveling for a company. If you email me, I'll spend some more time and, 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 and think that one through. Um, so you've taken a company from, you know, from so many people. When you get to that like 15, 20, and start getting more than just the core group, how do you handle the transparency of you know, how the company's doing? Like, the performance, the sales, the, you know, is that still disseminated widely or is it more starting to, I don't know, just like you have people at different that's levels. A, that's a great question. So the question was how transparent are you about numbers? I was fully transparent for every month I've ever been in business about revenue and expenses and burn and months to live. How did you do that? Like, did you like have a meeting um, every week or was it informal? Did you? We wrote our sales down. Our sales were on a board constantly, so revenue was there as it should be, you know, with the, the, the gong and everything. Right. And I would mail out finances. I don't know if I would do it every month, actually. I might, once a quarter, I think, I would send an email, a company update, and talk about what our burn was and where we needed to be. So I wouldn't exactly like mail out a P&L, because that's, right. but I, I would talk, I would give the exact amount of money we were burning and how long we had to live, which is a very uncomfortable thing to talk about, particularly when you're a little older, time to live. Right. And would you tell like people like, oh, yeah, we had a great sales month, but then like the next month was down, and then... For sure, yeah, okay. for sure, yeah. And that I was religious about. <coughs> yeah. And how, yeah. Did people, how did people react to that? You know, it... The, did they get nervous? The, no, they reacted like the normal, smart people that are all people really are, instead of being treated dumb. And I can actually say that I saw the effect of the opposite mechanism because the CEO that replaced me when I stepped down had the opposite approach. He never gave numbers up, never, ever, ever. Not even to his own VP team. It was just him and the CFO. And I saw the effect of that on the culture. Nobody knew what the hell was going on. So, I mean, the way I see it is startups are, it's extreme capitalism, right? There's an urgency. And to the extent that I'm going to bed every night with that urgency, I feel like everyone else should have that same urgency, and they're not going to have that without the data. Oh, any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, is there ever any reason to not be transparent, um, particularly mm -hmm. when it interferes with possible strategic decisions? Yes. Yep. How do you gauge that? There are reasons where you just it just, it's just plain stupid. But they're not near as many as you think. You know, uh, 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 keeping it secret, a product launch secret. You know, not talking about legal issues. There's, there, are, there are times, yeah. But I would say they are the minority and not the majority of the examples I've run into. How, how do you gauge, other than, if, if, if you don't have a way to sort of empirically gauge, you know, financially, which one is going to be um, a better choice for you, how, what do you base your when in doubt, 
go transparency because medium to long term it works out in your favor. That's just been my formula. There, I mean, there's those times where you're gonna have to, have to fire somebody, and you know you, you don't want to tell them two months out I'm looking for your replacement or they'll walk away. That's a, that's a challenging one. I would say that that is one where I have not been transparent because I didn't. Want, the one I, was thinking. I did not want a two month gap. You know, you have to go out and find the person. So there are things you got to do to keep the, the train on the tracks. You know, like six, seven people, eighty people. Um, how do you handle like at that level when someone leaves? Seventy or seventy seven? people. Okay. Like so, how do you handle like when someone leaves for? You know, it's still small enough that everybody knows everyone, um, but there's always, you know, seven people. There's just going to be times where someone's either not fitting in or moves on for other reasons. If they're moving on for something good, great, you know, good for them. Um, but when it's not, how transparent are you about, you know, the rationale why you need to let people go in terms of, you know, Well, you're actually, you're bound by law there to not be transparent, not, okay. tragically. Yeah. And in fact, even when, even when somebody calls you for a reference, the, the only thing you can say to avoid zero liability is yes, they worked here in early days. So that's just, you know, don't break the law. Okay. But I think, I think, yeah. Did you have How many people have you let go uh, at the early work of your uh, How many people have I fired? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my shit. Well, there's a distinction firing and letting go. Is is, well, if your company is about to go under and you need to lay off 20 people, that's a different type of experience than buying something because they're back in the company. Fair enough. You probably so, have both. Yes. Good, good distinction. So was your question layoff or firing? Well, let's, let, let's start with fired. How many people have I fired? Why have I fired people? Mm. I don't like the way they smell. No. Um, you know, you get really high. You get high turnover in sales for performance. Um, high turnover in support because the job sucks. Um, you get a lot of engineer poaching, particularly at a certain period of my career. There's a lot of poaching. Um, oh, I guess that wouldn't be firing. Um, for the same reasons everyone fires. I don't think there's anything unique in that. I do have a zero tolerance um, for transparency issues. You know, if, if somebody's been lying in the company, that, that, that's a zero tolerance rule. Why'd you ask that question? Uh, just curious, um, <laughs> in terms of firing for incompetence, uh, how often does that happen? Uh, well, that's one of the, that's another one of those challenging areas where the law you know, is, is, is a little bit gray, and so to the extent that you tell somebody that they suck, yeah. they sue you. And so the way I would handle that is I would not do that in writing, but I, I, would, I would follow the law, but I would give them a, some guidance as they left the company so that they understood, and it wasn't legal, but they would understand why they were being let go such that they could improve. And I just felt that that was my obligation. And I haven't been sued from that, that practice yet. So I wouldn't say I'm firing you because you're terrible. I would say we're letting you go. Do you mind if I give you some advice for your next job? And then I, and then I, would, I would shoot straight. And I, and I hate it. I mean, California labor laws are tough, really tough. And I, and I have been sued over those labor laws, o overtime stuff, yeah. So as long as you eat quiet, you're fine. As long as what? You eat quiet. Yeah, I mean, look, so the way I feel about the law is if it reflects um, what I think are good ethics, I think it's a good law, and if it doesn't, I don't care that much about it other than the company, so I, I feel okay, yeah. but I also don't want to get the company in trouble, so I would give them advice, give them candid advice at some minor liability risk to, to us, right? Can, can you just say that they're ineligible for rehire? What? Can you just say that they're ineligible for rehire? As, as an employee, like if you, if you let someone go and someone calls for a reference, can't you? Can't that be the answer when someone calls you to ask for a reference? Oh, you're talking about for reference? Yeah. Um, as I understand it, per my last HR director, 
the safest thing, that, the thing that he says and what he has been trained to do is to say, they worked here, yes, from this date to this date. And the title. And the title, right. Yeah. I, I just don't know if you could say that. This is tricky stuff, right? Dancing between transparency and business, which is so shrouded, and, and I and I know this is tricky stuff, and, and I hope it, I hope this is helpful. Yeah. So maybe a forward question to model, especially some of the earlier stuff. Um, when you have founders, I don't know if you fired founders, how you could have that, three times. That, that's Twice. how you get into equity distribution, or what's been what's happened at that point. I mean, unless it's going to be conventional, sometimes it's not. So do you have a rule for that? You mean when you fire a founder, you know, do you do you take away their equity? And, and or at what point do you do that? And or what? Or at always? Or what? In the two K, is it three? Uh, it, there was three founders I've had to fire at two companies, um, and in in all cases I let them keep all of their equity. We were at a point where we were already funded, and they had taken the risk too. They were just hurting the company. And, and I, for me, the question is, how, how would I be able to sleep at, what would make me sleep the best at night? That's my general rule. And I felt not stiffing this guy, even though he was a total maniac, he was one of the reasons we got to where we got. And so I gave him, and by the way, he had 40% of the company. So I made him a multi-billionaire four years later. And we're still friends. And we're still friends, even though I fired him. You should be your friend. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. Can you say why? Um, yeah, I can. He, uh, he didn't, his personality didn't scale. And he was a genius tech guy, um, but a really bad communicator and erratic. And he would throw fits. And once he'd literally laid down on the lawn in front of the office and wouldn't move, I had to call the police, and like he was doing, he was an interesting cat. Yeah, so I had some messages. And the, and, the, and the other founder I had to fire, also a tech, was um was just really negative to, to, to staff. And, and it wasn't so obvious when there was five of us, but as the team built out from under it, he was just negative, door closed all the time. Yes? Uh, have you had any situation when your business partner ask you to be less transparent than how you do it. You didn't catch that, sorry. If your business partner asked you to be less transparent, how, did you have any situations like that and how you do it? Yeah, and, that, and, that, and that, that, that happens constantly. His question was, if your business partner asks you to be less than transparent, how do you handle it? So, other than a few cases we've been talking about, some legal and employment issues, to me it's just it's a non-starter. I would say that's not how we do business. And eventually I got tired of it and I made a corporate motto and then that question stopped coming. And, and I would say if your business partner continues to ask that of you, um, imagine how much stuff you don't know about him. As a general guideline. 